Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? We have a wonderful rain coming down. Looks like we've got almost a week of rain. Thank you, Lord. We really needed this. This is going to set us up good for spring. And it's just nice to listen to it. This morning, we're going to be reading out of Titus 3.9. Avoid foolish questions. Before we start, before we get into the scripture, I'd like to offer up a prayer for Brother Jesse, Diamond Justification, and for everybody who is in similar areas that are receiving this record snowfall. I was stationed at Fort Drum uh, in Watertown, living in Watertown, right on the shores of Lake Ontario. I've seen this kind of snow before. It's legendary. Lord, watch over our brothers and sisters who are stuck in these situations. Our brothers and sisters who are having to struggle through this and having to deal with this. This is very heavy, heavy snow. It can be very dangerous. Lord, please, please provide for them everything they need and watch over them and keep them. And keep them encouraged in your word while this is going on. Maybe being blocked in is a great time to spend more time in the word, in the Bible, reading your word. So Lord, please watch over them. That's our prayer this morning. Amen. So, avoid foolish questions. Let's go to this. Now, I've had this happen to me before. I had an army buddy who was talking about that the Bible hasn't been properly um, interpreted and used an example of the definition of the word rod. And I told them, you can't use that as a, as a guidepost to try to decide whether the Bible is improperly translated or not. There's multiple types of rods. There's multiple styles of rods. There's multiple definitions depending on the context that is being used in. So you can't use that as a as a way to try to discount what the Bible it says or that it's been properly translated. You have to take it in its full context instead of just picking one word. But you know that that kind of stuff, those kind of questions always end up going south. And that one did. In fact, almost every conversation goes south. Because people have their own idea about these things. They have their own idea about how this stuff works. Whether they call themselves a Christian or not, they have their own opinions. And they don't want to give those up. They don't want to say, okay, this is what it says, that's what I'm going to go with. And, and come to the place where they admit, I don't know what this book means, I don't know what it says. I need the Lord to teach me. So in Titus... In verse 9, he gives this declaration, but avoid foolish disputes. And these disputes are a waste of time. When people sit down, they start going on about uh, homosexuality. So why, do, why does God hate homosexuals? He doesn't hate them. He hates the sins that everybody does. He hates the sins that you do and I do. Homosexuality is just one of them. See, people want to hyper-focus on homosexuality, forgetting the things that they do wrong. You're a liar. You're a thief. You hate others. You look down on others. You know. You say nasty things to other people. You go through the Bible, you find all that stuff in there. If you can get one over on somebody, you do. Taking advantage of them, manipulating them. So, people hyper-focus on one single thing, but forget they're just as much to blame as anybody else because they do the same sins. It just looks a little different. This is a waste of time because when somebody is hyper-focused on that, they're not going to listen to anything else. I've learned this from experience. Genealogies. They sit there and they go through books and books and books talking about, well, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew through this family line. I'm a Jew this family line. Mm, okay. And your point is what? Well, that makes me different. That makes me special. No, it doesn't. Because you are just as much condemned as everybody else until you become saved. Until the Lord saves you. Contentions. Always going back and forth about who's right and who's wrong. What does this mean? What does that mean? I've come to the place, and I used to do this, and I've come to the place now where I'm like, this is a non-argument. And somebody wants to sit there and they want to talk about the rapture. Um, I don't care if you think I'm wrong. It's a non-argument. You're sitting there arguing about something in a book that you have no clue what it means. I don't either. 
I'm just going to go by what it says, and here's what the word says. Our opinions don't apply. Giving. The law, the Ten Commandments. You can give them the scripture that proves it clearly and says it plainly all day long. They're still not going to believe it. They don't care. They just want to contend. They desire to argue. Striving's about the law. People go on and on and on. Better follow this. But you know that one, I think he let us, uh, let us have a mulligan on that one. No, you either keep the law or you don't. That's what the scripture says. If you keep it, you better keep every single piece of it. If you miss it in one point, you've, you've messed up. Guess what? You already did that. And didn't even know it. You did it when you learned to speak. First thing a child does is lie when they learn to speak. For they are unprofitable and useless. It's a big problem that we deal with today. Not only in unbelievers, but in people that are professors too. I have an army buddy. He, he's just like that. Exactly like that. It's narcissism. Extreme narcissism. What do we do? How do we communicate with those people? We can't. See, the Lord has to bring them down to the end of themselves. Humble them so that they will finally look up and see him instead of looking at themselves. It's a big problem. And what it does is it makes our job even harder. Now, that doesn't mean we don't spread the message. But when it becomes clear that this is not going to go anywhere, that this person is not interested in anything that we have to say, well, then it's time to just mark and avoid. I'm, I'm finished. Oh, you gave up. You gave up. Yes, I gave up. Whatever makes you feel good. No, because I, I was able to... No, you didn't debate anything. You just sat there and ran your mouth. You just sat there and talked. It, it meant nothing. And I'm not interested in something that doesn't glorify God. This doesn't glorify God at all. You turn around, you turn your back and walk away. Leave them standing there talking, thinking that they've won something. They've won nothing. In fact, they've actually gained, gained some more condemnation by doing that. This is why I try, when I can identify this, get away from this. Because I don't want anybody to, com com to continue to sin on, because of me, on my behalf. I, w I would rather put a stop to that and not have anything to do with that person anymore so that they no longer sin because of me. I don't want to be the catalyst for them sinning even more. Let's read this in context now. Let's just start at the beginning here. Be ready for every good work. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. And there's a bunch of people out there today called 1A auditors. And they say they're doing God's work by going out there and tormenting people and terrorizing people. Trying to exercise their rights and prove their rights. What they forget is if in the exercising of your right you violate my rights, you've now become wrong. They say they're doing God's work, that we're supposed to resist the establishment. Well, the Bible says different, and we just read it here in Titus. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Simple. Simple. So to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Are we perfect in this? Absolutely not, but this is what we're told to do. Speak evil of no one. What do we hear? Exactly the opposite. See, they don't read the Bible and they don't see this. They forget this. Now, back in 2019, I was doing this stuff. I was following the crowd. But I started to realize this is something I should not be doing. This is something I shouldn't be taking in. This is a waste of time. And it doesn't help anybody who's seeing it. It isn't a blessing to them. This that we're doing right now is. Verse 3, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hating, or hateful and hating one another. That's the life of an unbeliever. Now, when you see a Christian doing that, or somebody who has taken the title of Christian doing that, what does that tell you? Either they're just now coming out of that, or there's a whole lot more going on there. And they're not really saved. Verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, 
He saved us. Not because of us, not because of what we've done, not because of anything involving us, because of Him, His mercy, He saved us. Although, or through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. There's your, there's your baptism. It's not the washing of water, it's the washing of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now here's the secret. The Holy Spirit was poured out on everybody to a certain degree. The only way you can come around the corner and see him and see that you need to be saved is because the Holy Spirit is convicting you to do so. So everybody has a little piece of the Holy Spirit in them. That's the conviction that they feel. That's the guilt that they feel leading them to, to a different path. When they deny that spirit, when they deny the leading of the Holy Spirit that's in them, when they deny that stuff and turn away from it, that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. We have a lot of people today doing that. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. What good works? This is a question I ask constantly when people say, you need to be out there doing good works. Okay, what good works? Be specific. They can't answer the question because they don't know. What's good works? Prayer. Thanksgiving. Praise. Glory. Worship. Those are good works. Because some people can't go out there and give a bunch of money. Some people can't go out there and help others because of their health conditions. Some people can't do a whole bunch of things. How are they supposed to produce good works if that's everybody's opinion of what a good work is? Well, these are good works too. Being a prayer warrior is a wonderful, wonderful service to God. And to the brethren. And it's a good work. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a device of man after the first and the second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. This is why whenever it's clear this person isn't going to see the light, it's clear they're not going to hear the, hear the truth. <clears throat> they have made their own path. And they're in there in the bushes, sweating and wearing themselves out, trying to blaze their own path. When they could just walk the path the Lord has already cut. Turn away. Walk away. Let them go. Leave them. Those people are trying to get their own way to heaven. By their opinion instead of their instead of the truth. So we don't deal with them anymore. Reject them. Be done. Uh, nope. Finished. And they're going to sit there and they're going to make all these statements. You just turn around and walk away and leave them alone. I've done that recently. It's too much stress. It's a waste of time. I mean, when a, when a person sits there claiming to be a Christian, compares themselves to Jesus Christ, there's a problem. That person is extremely, extremely bad problem. And they're going to have to deal with that. So... I'm going to remove myself from the equation. I don't want to be a catalyst for sin in any way that I possibly can. So these are the instructions we're given. These are the things we're to watch out for. We were these things. We did these things. And now we're commanded to stay away from them. Avoid foolish questions. Our days are few and are far better spent in doing good than in disputing over matters which are, at best, of minor importance. People sit there and they go on and on and on about the rapture. On and on and on. I love the rapture too. But to sit there and try to decide when it's going to happen is irrelevant. There will be one. Let's look forward to that. When you think it is, does not matter. The Bible says there is one. 
The old schoolmen did a world of mischief by their incessant discussion of subjects of no practical importance, and our churches suffer much from petty wars over obtrusive points and unimportant questions. After everything has been said that can be said, neither party is any wiser, and therefore the discussion no more promotes knowledge than love. And it is foolish to sow in so barren a field questions upon points wherein Scripture is silent. Right now, the big question is tithing. Well, that's what they did in the Old Testament, okay? What happened to the New Testament? Where is it mentioned? Well, I mean, it's not per se, but the example is given. Where? Well, whenever they were the woman with the two mites, whenever the Jesus was talking to them about the, the tithing of mint and the anis and everything. Yeah. Notice that was always referred to to the people who were following the law, not to everyone else. Notice that was something that was given specifically to the Jews, not to everyone else. Notice that if Jesus is our example, and Jesus never tithed once, as far as anything is being recorded... Why are you so hyper-focused on tithing? That does not make you better Christian. That does not make you better standing. That does not give you anything exclusive. This question is dead. Give. Your heart will tell you what to give. That's how much you give. It doesn't have to be 10%. It can be 80%. It can be 2%. It can be whatever your heart tells you to give. Whenever your heart tells you to give it. That's what the Bible gives us. God loves a cheerful giver. Give from the heart. So the question is a ridiculous question, because what it does is it is de-evolving down to two people arguing over it. Why would we sit and argue over something when the Lord did not even give us any strict dictates to that? I remind people constantly, that was only given to the Jews, not to everyone else. What happens to the Gentiles in the book of Acts when they had the big meeting? And they said, what do, we, what, do we, what do these people do? Here, here's these four things. You guys do these, you'll do fine. Notice tithing wasn't mentioned in there at all. So the question is a non-question. It's just going to cause arguments. It's ridiculous. Questions upon points where in Scripture is silent... Upon mysteries which belong to God alone, like the date of the rapture. Upon prophecies of doubtful interpretation and upon mere modes of observing human ceremonials are all foolish and wise men avoid them. Because there are so many things now in today where people ask questions about things that do not matter to the grand scheme of things. Salvation is the most important. Get there first, then the rest of it will fall into place. Like somebody's asking me about the definition here in this spot is for rod is used for this, and then over here it's another one. Okay, let's go look at the particular scriptures. This word for rod is used in two different contexts. That's why it's a different definition. That's a silly thing to, to describe or to use as a description of improper interpretation of the Bible. But see, people will believe whatever makes them feel good, whatever justifies them, instead of believing the truth, which hurts. Just like this says. Prophecies of doubtful interpretation. How many times have we seen that? They love to go through the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and completely inter misinterpret what they say. And then argue about it. Modes of observing human ceremonials got to go to church. you got to be in church. Really? Where's that in the Bible? It just says, do not, do not turn away from meeting together. There's nothing, that has, that's not church. That's brothers and sisters coming together. We just happen to put a building around that. Are all foolish and wise men avoid them. Our business is neither to ask nor answer foolish questions, but to avoid them altogether. And if we observe the Apostles' precept, Titus 3.8, to be careful to maintain good works, we shall find ourselves far too much occupied with profitable business to take much interest in unworthy, contentious, and needless strivings. What these things do is they cause bitterness. They create in a person a wrong understanding and a wrong impression. It causes division, 
we're told not to do those things. Now, if you don't answer somebody's question because you see that it's a foolish question, that is going to create a whole lot of ire. It's going to create a whole lot of, of, of issues on the other person's part because you now decline to do that. What I found in my personal experience is that when there's a group of people speaking and nobody knows the Bible but one or two people, and somebody asks a question like that and the person answers, the rest of the people who don't have that same interpretation or understanding, even unbelievers, are going to argue immediately and it's going to continue to be an argument. So doing this in a group set, a group context is absolutely a waste of time. It always falls apart. So far for me that it has been the experience. I would rather do a one-on-one -on -one and then I can show them the scriptures clearly. But the problem today is not hardly anybody asks. Even people who are curious about it won't ask the people that they know know what they're talking about or have at least had more study than them. Because now the distrust of Christians has come. Because of, quote-unquote, other Christians. The, the false professors. I think that was part of Satan's plan. Ruin the credibility of the church and the believers. So that the world wouldn't ask them questions. But instead would go ask other people who weren't believers questions. Hey, you go to Catholic Church, don't you? Hey, let me ask you this. And since they don't ever read the Bible, very, very, very few, they give their opinion instead of what the Bible actually says. And you'll always hear this statement. Well, this is what I think. Well, I believe this. But what does the Bible say? So you can see how it can fall apart very quickly. There are, however, some questions which are the reverse of foolish, which we must not avoid but fairly and honestly meet, such as these. Do I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I renewed in the spirit of my mind? Am I walking not after the flesh but after the spirit? Am I growing in grace? Does my conversation adorn the doctrine of God my Savior? Am I looking for the coming of the Lord and watching as a servant should do who expects his master? What more can I do for Jesus? Such inquiries as these urgently demand our attention, and if we have been at all given to cavailing, let us now turn our critical abilities to a service so much more profitable. Let us be peacemakers and endeavor to lead others both by our precept and example to avoid foolish questions. I'll admit, I don't do it perfectly. And there's some times where the way the person is wording it, it, it pulls me in and I don't even realize what I'm being drawn into until after the fact. And, and most times I fail. Especially when it's somebody who is very, very aggressive and very hateful. And as soon as anybody asks a question or says anything and they don't agree with it, they immediately fly off the handle and start to attack. I respond with I respond in kind in most cases before I can catch myself to put the wall up and stop right there. When I see that happen, when I realize I've been pulled into that, I do everything I can to pull out of that stuff. I'm out. I'm not interested in this anymore. And I have to learn to be better at that. Be better at catching myself beforehand and just avoid it altogether. The world, and as much as I hate this, as much as, as we may hate to have to turn away from somebody who's like that because they need to hear the truth and we care enough about them to give them that truth, it's more important for us not to have anything to do with them and to pray for them instead because we can give them the truth in prayer and privacy. Because all that situation is going to do is push them further away. This is what I've learned from experience. It's just going to push them away. So whenever those conversations come up, and it's civil, some, civil or even somewhat civil, what I tell the other people is, is that, look, don't ever believe me or anyone else what we tell you. You need to go do your own research. You need to go find out for yourself. And here's where you start, in the Bible itself. Start in the Bible itself, and then work your way out. Because if you want to know what the truth is, don't believe a person who's read it. Believe the person who wrote it, and he gave you the book to read it. Now, if you don't believe the Bible is true, if you don't think that Bible is properly translated, again, you need to do more research. You need to make sure you have a pinpoint place, an anchor point for truth. 
if it's not from this scripture, if you can't decide that that's legitimate, then this is not for you. Christianity and faith in Jesus Christ is not for you. If you can't bring yourself to believe something is accurate when you read it. But I'm going to remind you. Why do you take cold medicine? Does the package tell you it does this and you believe that? Then why can't you read the Bible and when it tells you this, why can't you believe that? Do you believe what the car manufacturer puts on their brochure about a vehicle? Then why don't you believe what the Bible says? If you can read all these other things in the world and believe them, why can't you believe that? And if you were going to say immediately, well, this guy says this, this guy says that, okay? A lot of people say a lot of things. That's all opinions. Prove it. See, I went and proved it. I proved the Bible is accurate. It's very easy to do. It's very simple. We're never going to win. Jesus already won. We're never going to win these little arguments, these little discussions, these little contentions. This is why Titus tells us, and, and Timothy also tells us not to get involved in this stuff. We're not going to win. They have already decided. And since they already have a hatred for you, deep down inside, like we talked about the other day, since they already look down on you as being less than them, there's no way we're going to be able to win them over until they come to a certain place where they're willing to actually take the time to listen and consider what you have to say. The Lord will open their heart. All we have to do is pray for them. The Lord will reveal to them the reality of the truth. Now, the reality of that is also is that not everybody is going to receive it. For our peace, for our contentment, for the, the grace and for mercy and for love, we are to avoid these things because they are never going to lead anywhere good. And I'm speaking from personal experience, having had multitudes of these conversations. It never goes well. It never ends well. It never even begins well in most cases. I've had email after email. I've had comment after comment. I've had conversation after conversation face to face. It never, ever goes that way. People have already decided what they want to believe. They don't want to go and learn something new in case they may have been wrong about that. And what I've found is if they are believing improperly or incorrectly something from the Bible, it's because they got it from someone else. They didn't get it from the Scripture themselves. Because when you go to the Scripture and say, well, here's what the Scripture says. Their immediate defense mechanism on the doctrine they love so much that they got from someone else is, well, you're misinterpreting that. No, I'm just reading it for what it says. Well, but, but that's wrong. That's improper. So I'm reading it wrong? You're telling me that the words I'm seeing on this page are not the right words? Well, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's what it sounds like you're saying. It sounds like you're saying I can't comprehend what I read, which now you are insulting me. So I'm reading what it says, and that's what it says. I believe I'm not the one with the problem. I believe you are, because you have a doctrine you got from someone else and not from these scriptures, and this assaults that doctrine, and you don't like it. So now you've got to come to terms with this. Do you want to believe what the Bible says or believe what somebody told you it says? Don't ever, ever, ever believe what I tell you about this Bible. In these videos, don't ever, ever, ever believe me. Ever believe what the Bible says. Go to the Bible and read it. Every true Bible teacher out there, every true watchman out there, anybody who is sharing this in any form or any context should be telling you, do not ever believe what I tell you. Believe what the book says. That's the truth. That book, what's in that book is the truth. I am just an, a fallible human being spreading the message the best I can. So when the time comes and these conversations arise, what do we do? Avoid them. When we finally see that this is not going to go well, guys, I'm going to dip out of this. Oh, well, well, hold on a minute. No, because you guys have already decided what you want to believe. You're not going to listen to anything I say. So now this has just become a waste of time and it's become entertainment for you. Not interested. I have more important things to do. Oh, you think you're special? No. But I think you're special enough for me not to sit here and waste your time telling you something you're never going to receive anyway.
I love you enough and care enough about you not to waste your time. When you're ready to actually have an adult discussion about this, to actually look at this for what it says, to actually see if you can understand what this says, then we can have a conversation. But right now you're not ready. Because this is important. This isn't a joke. This isn't a playtime. This is important. And they don't take it seriously. That's why they say what they say and do what they do. So we're told, avoid it. Don't have anything to do with it. Stay away from it. It's just going to bring you down. And it's just going to make them worse. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. To give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this devotion. If it doesn't glorify you, it's a waste of time. And this is something that you have taught me. If the conversation isn't glorifying to you, there's no sense in going through with it. There's no sense in continuing. It's a waste of time. How many of these conversations do we get pulled into? Some, most of the time, not even realizing it. And it is a complete waste of time. It doesn't glorify you in any way. Thousands upon thousands of times. But this is Satan's way. Confuse everything. Ruin the credibility of the believer. And I'll admit, in many of those cases, I'm caught off guard and end up responding just as harshly as they have responded to me. To shut the thing down, to stop it where it is. No, this is not, we're not crossing this line. Stop right here. And I hate it. I hate that it brings that out in me. But this is the way of narcissism. This is the way of those who are high-minded and think that they already know. But everything that they know is all part of their opinion. They look down on everybody else. They look down on anybody else, even those they call their friends, even those they call their family. They see them in a much darker light because they now see themselves in a much brighter one. Well, Lord, you tell us here in Titus and in other places, don't get caught up in this. Now, Lord, I have to admit, sometimes it's hard to tell when we're going to get caught up in that. This is where we need you to show us so that we have discernment to know this is going to be a waste of time. We need to get away from this. Not have anything to do with this because it is not going to profit anybody. <coughs> and it will not glorify you. Father, I pray you forgive us when we make the mistake of getting caught up in these things. When we get drawn in unawares. When we respond improperly. Because of anger or frustration. And I pray for those who are doing these things. Getting us into these situations. That you show them the truth and open their eyes that they may see. Give them the most painful conviction. Because that's what it takes for almost all of us, is painful conviction to turn us around. My desire is that everybody knows the truth. Because if they all know the truth, there's no excuse. It is their liter it is It would be the person's literal... Denial, desire to deny the truth that will show them for who they really are. But I hate that it's people I care about, people that I love and look up to, people that I have affection for, that I have to walk away from, that I have to stop talking to because they're not interested in hearing it. They're not interested in receiving the truth. They're just interested in hating others. And showing that hate to others. Lord, it's a terrible thing that has happened in this world. It's a terrible state that this world is in. That they do these things. They seek to do these things. Well, Father, help us to not be caught up in them. Just like Titus 3.9 says, help us to avoid these things. Because it is a waste of time. It's to the ruin of the hearers. It is a waste of time. I'm looking forward to the day when this doesn't exist anymore, when this isn't an issue anymore, when you've put a stop to all this. And the way it is now, especially now, with the way things are and how close we are, it's so bad now, it's almost like a person doesn't even want to be involved in any conversation 
with anyone secular because it's, it's almost always devolves into something else. We're never right. We're never correct. We have no legitimacy. We have no standing with anyone because we're a believer. So as soon as people realize you're an actual believer, they immediately look down on you and everything. Now, this is the case all the time. I have people that are staunch atheists that have a very high level of respect for me. Not very many, but some. Because we look past what we believe. For the most part, most of the world has this deep-seated hatred for us. Well, it's no surprise. Satan does too. And if they're following Satan, if Satan is their father, just like Jesus told the Pharisees, your father is Satan. That's why you hate me. Same applies here. Father, help us to avoid this. I had a blow up here the other day, and I wish I could have seen it coming and avoided it. Because it was just a complete waste of time. Help us to avoid these things. Help us to stay away from people like this. Help us to not have anything to do with these kinds of things. It's for our peace. It's for our growth. And it's not going to do them any good anyway. But that also, we don't become the catalyst for them sinning. I don't want anybody to sin because of me. So I would rather not even be involved in it. You'll get them. Their, their turning the corner has nothing to do with me. You'll get them. You have your very amazing ways of getting people and getting into their hearts. So, Lord, we will pray for them. We lift them up today. Get into their hearts. Change them. Turn them. Make them to believe. So that they may see the light the way we do. So that they may see you the way we do. So they may come across the threshold and stand on the path that leads to salvation. Instead of standing in the dark yelling for somebody to turn the light on. And they're holding one in their hand. For your glory, Father. If it doesn't glorify you, it's a waste of time. For your glory, always. We thank you for your mercy and grace and your great love, your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. If it doesn't glorify God, it is a waste of time. That doesn't just mean conversations. That means anything. If, if a certain type of giving, if a certain type of good work or, or something that we deem that way or that the world deems that way, if it doesn't glorify God, it's a waste of time. It's a wasted effort. These conversations, these... Foolish questions, sometimes it's hard because they word them so secretively to try to get the conversation started because they just want to see if they can make you look bad. And it's ridiculous. But that's their desire because they have nothing better to look forward to than to try to start arguments. And I hate when it happens. I want to answer the question to help them understand. But sometimes, because I'm naive... I don't realize that's not really what they're looking for. They're just looking to start an issue. They're just looking to create division. Well, maybe it's time we stopped having time for them. And this could be friends, it could be family. Maybe it's time we stopped giving them our time and instead gave the Lord our time. Sorry, I have more important things to do. I am going to worship God instead of wasting my time on a question that you don't even want the answer for anyway. It's going to seem very arrogant to them. It's going to seem very uh, selfish to them. We can't change that. What we can leave them with is, when you're serious, when you're really serious about knowing the truth, come to me and ask me, and I'll share with you what I've learned from this book. Otherwise, 
Why are we here? <laughs> Why are we still here? They need to see us for who we really are. And sometimes that might mean standing afar off. Again, they're going to take it wrong until they realize what's really happening. And that's where the Lord comes in. The Lord will convict their heart for that. So don't worry if you have to walk away. I have to, constantly. Don't worry if you have to walk away and avoid people. Don't worry if you have to stay away from people. Don't worry if you have to cut people off. It's going to hurt. It's going to feel bad. Don't worry about it. Because the Lord will get them. He will change them. He will turn them around. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'll see you in the next video.